everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on shelf life studies. We're excited to have you here with us. My name is Jessica, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Sales here at Amtech. I'll be moderating today's webinar. First off, we encourage everyone to participate by asking questions throughout the presentation. You can submit questions by clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll have some time at the end to go over the questions that came through. We will also be recording today's webinar, which will be made available on our website. To start off, for those of you who don't know, Amtech is an accredited laboratory in the San Francisco Bay Area, specializing in food safety testing and special research projects such as shelf life, challenge, validation, and investigation studies. Today's webinar will be led by Dr. Eric Wilhelmsen. Dr. Wilhelmsen is a recognized authority in food spoilage, shelf life extension, risk management, and quality improvement. We are also joined by our research laboratory director, Dr. Heidi Wright. Dr. Wright is in charge of all the shelf life studies here at Amtech, so you'll have the opportunity to ask her some questions at the end as well. And with that, let's get started. Eric? All right, sort of as an outline, we have a number of questions we're gonna try and address, starting with the obvious, what is shelf life? Um, often, Everybody thinks they know, but we'll be a little bit more specific. We're gonna talk about why products fail, um, what makes it a shelf life study rather than just waiting for product to spoil, and why are shelf life studies important? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, we're gonna give you some suggestions about when a shelf life study can help your business. Um, then we'll turn it over to Heidi and she'll talk about how to design a shelf life study. And of course, we're going to tell you how we want to help you. Um, starting with that first question, what is shelf life? Shelf life is the period of time that a product is suitable for a purpose. You know, there's nothing about spoilage in this. It's all about purpose. Um, most products will age out of their shelf life at some point. There are some different products that must age before their true shelf life begins. People advertise how much Parmesan cheese is aged before they start selling it. Um, fine wines, you're supposed to age them to get their complexity. One of the other things that's really important to recognize is there's rarely a sharp transition between good and unacceptable. There's kind of a smear that ends shelf life. So everybody talks about it and says, the shelf life of my product is two and a half years. Um, it all depends on what you're being using it for. Um, this graph is kind of simplistic, but it illustrates the points. I remember my econ professor always using a straight line to show how everything works. Shelf life doesn't always decay in a nice straight line, but we can see desirability, how suitable it is for a purpose and time, and there is a place where it's acceptable quality. And we define that as a shelf life, but there's kind of a distribution about this. Um, when we start trying to predict shelf life, the rate of degradation is affected by many factors. We'll talk about some of those today. It's important to remember that shelf life is always ultimately determined by the customer and the consumer. Fond of saying the marketplace is always right by definition. So if people stop buying your product because they find it unacceptable, you've exceeded its shelf life, assuming of course that it was originally acceptable. One of the problems in assessing shelf life 
is that not all units of a product will age at the same rate. You take a basket of strawberries like the little picture here, they don't all get moldy at the same time. You have a few cases of a shelled juice beverage in fiber cartons or um, milk cartons if you prefer, and pinholes that allow oxygen in can cause vitamin C degradation at various rates. So some of them will meet the label claim and some percentage will not at the supposed end of shelf life. So for many applications, you need to include a percentage of units and a quality metrics for defining the shelf life. Um, there's a temptation to cherry pick the best units of a product to claim a long shelf life, but this is usually a mistake, but it can provide insights for increasing shelf life. Go back to our strawberries. Um, that berry right in the front seems really good. What was different from it and the strawberry that went moldy? Did it retain moisture better? Was the moldy one bruised? And so there was a location for mold growth to start. We don't have all the facts. We can only speculate. But when you do a good shelf life study, you have the opportunity to investigate. Another complication is that the same product can have more than one shelf life because it has multiple purposes. I'm guessing that many of you have made a banana cake or banana bread and appreciate the utility of overripe bananas giving more flavor and sweetness. Bananas well beyond when you want to eat them fresh. Um, broccoli that is gone a bit yellow with the little florets opening. These are the little blossoms that make up the head. So it's turning yellow. Might make quite acceptable soup even if you would not want to steam it or put it into a pasta salad or something. <clears throat> Differences can be a, in degree of flavor, desired attribute, or maybe an entirely different failure mode. But knowing what a product is going to be used for or in um, is important for establishing the shelf life. All right, the boundaries between good and unacceptable are driven generally by two big categories, food safety and quality. And of course, this lead, we're talking about consumer health or consumer satisfaction. Sometimes a, a mold growth or something is really all about consumer satisfaction and not health. But um, we need to consider both these areas when you're trying to figure out the shelf life of a product. Now, we can divide failures into three big categories, intrinsic, storage, and failures in execution. Some of these we can change, others are just related to the food product. Examining failures in execution. If you use the wrong or poor quality ingredients in your product, it may be misbranded. It may not meet consumer expectations. If you're making a high quality juice beverage and you're using low cost apple juice concentrate, it may not taste the same as it did during development when you were pressing your own apples, not even using concentrate. Um, 
incomplete or inadequate processing, not enough mixing, um, too short a retort time, um, insufficient product cooling. If you have a fresh produce item and you pack it hot, it might be many hours for the middle of a pallet to cool. If you're doing a pasteurized product, leaving it at warm temperatures too long can seriously degrade the quality. Um, Post-process contamination, if you're recontaminating a product, you're gonna get mold growth. Failed packaging, the picture here illustrates what's probably a hydrogen swell. The acid from the oranges and the, the packing syrup has attacked the metal on the can and you're getting hydrogen. Spectacular looking cans. Um, usually if it goes far enough, one of the seams ruptures and now you've got quality that the retailers don't like because you've got juice and stuff all over the other products. <clears throat> and the last one in execution, failures in sanitation. If your plant isn't clean, you can end up with organisms inside. Um, Alicyclobacillus is the nemesis of juice processors who aren't careful enough because it's very difficult to get out of a plant once contaminated and all your pasteurized juice products get spoiled by it. The next category, failures in story and transportation. Um, we got four big categories that can cause damage. Temperature, um, if you store a juice product at too high a temperature, it will go brown. Um, if you've got a frozen product, you can go icy, something like a sorbet or ice cream. If it's a still metabolically active, like a fresh cut product, the high temperatures will deplete sugars and cause senescence. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Too low, you can freeze things and this can change metabolism. And if it's too variable, you end up with what's usually water migration. You can get ice crystal formation. Um, humidity, too much promotes microbial growth. Too little dries out the product. Baked goods are especially subject to drying out. Oxygen, um, if you have a controlled atmosphere packaging system, if you have too much oxygen, it's not gonna work. You can get off flavors. Um, too little, you can get anaerobic reactions leading to fermented flavors. That's more typical of a fresh product. Light promotes um, free radical reactions, um, which lead to bleaching and color loss. Failures intrinsic to the product is one where we're recognizing the limitations of the products we've made. This relates to the chemistry and composition of the ingredients or components of the product or the product if it's a pure system. Um, products naturally have chemistry that can occur not everything is as stable as hard, dry wheat, which will still sprout after centuries in the tombs of Egypt. Most things are a little bit more perishable. You can get color changes, off flavors, spoilage, and all these things are intrinsic to the product. These are things that we can attempt to control with our packaging and processing, 
and handling, but we need to be aware of the potential. Um, microbial mechanisms, Florence has given a cut. You can go to the Amtec channel and see the whole recording. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. We can spend all our time there. Instead, we're going to look at an area of my expertise, the chemistry. Um, I don't recommend you store or put all these foods together like in this picture. Um, they don't really like being stored together, but it's a pretty background to just go through and look at about 10 mechanisms of failure. Senescence, overripening, rancidity, loss of vitamins, condensation reactions, color change, degradation of proteins, photochemical, staling, These are all things you've probably seen in your personal experience. Some of them you'll probably have seen in the course of doing business. Um, decarboxylation is another way you can get packages to um, rupture, getting the generation of CO2. We're going to take a quick look through this. Um, this too could be a webinar in and of itself. Senescence. This is a deterioration with age and it's generally related to the loss of energy reserves. You get a general breakdown of tissue and brightness. Um, most foods don't last forever. And one of the key things here, it's potentiating for other mechanisms of failure, particularly microbial spoilage. So if you leave a, some lettuce in the refrigerator, first it seems to lose its brightness and then it gets softer and that's senescence at work. And as it progresses, you have the opportunistic microbial spoilage, maybe something like an Arrhenia soft rot that you get down to the bottom of these packages where the leaves start making icky green mush. So that's senescence. Overripening is a problem with climacteric fruit. Um, a lot of enzymes are released that soften things. I mean, everybody likes a soft, ripe peach, but the distance between soft and ripe and it's a soggy mess is not that great. There's a lot of climacteric fruit that are a big part of the human diet. There's a list here. Um, it's also important to recognize that there are some commonly eaten fruits that aren't on this list. For example, pineapple is as ripe as it'll get when it's harvested. So the idea of leaving a pineapple on your kitchen counter to ripen isn't going to work. So again, it's knowing your product and knowing what mechanism you're trying to control. Moving on, loss of vitamins. This is especially important when with fortified products or products labeled to meet a certain um, nutritional value. Um, a, C, and E are subject to oxidation. Vitamin C is a big selling point for um, juice products. I mentioned the problem of pinholes in 
the oxygen bearers in heart and juice products. Those are especially troubling because most of your product can meet its shelf life, but some percentage that have cracks in the oxygen barriers will not. And studying that kind of an executional problem takes very large um, sets of samples. Color changes. You see the meat pictured here, certainly not the bright red you associate with fresh meat. We have met hemoglobin formation. Um, plant pigments, pigments particularly um, the anthocyanins and the ones with extended conjugations like the carotenes and chlorophyll are subject to light reactions. These pigments can oxidize, they can interact with metal ions. Um, was working many years ago on a tropical fruit cocktail in a can. The bananas put into the mix turned bright purple as they interacted with the tin from they had protoanthocyanins. Um, these changes are generally cosmetic, but are also generally not accepted by consumers. Proteins are very structural in food. They give also add to taste. Um, they're very important for products that have foam or overrun. And they're subject to um, reaction just like most biomolecules, cross-linking. Um, there are reactive side chains and they can be broken. Condensation reactions. Um, this is a big category, includes lots of things. Um, these reactions are undesirable in juice products and other fruits. Um, many years ago, made a pineapple sauce product. It was really good when it was fresh, but controlling oxygen was absolutely critical because the plan was to put it into glass or plastic where the consumer could see it. And if we didn't get all the oxygen out of the puree, it turned brown rapidly with exposure to a little bit of temperature. One of the things about these reactions is they're so complicated that studying them is difficult. But these same reactions are desirable in other products because they yield the rich brown colors and the rich taste. I mean, the cheese on this dish needs to have that touch of brown on top. Photochemical, as I've mentioned before, light promotes free radical reactions. And this is why many packages are opaque. Um, Producers need to be aware that the fluorescent lights in grocery stores emit a significant amount of UV light, which can just bleach your products. It can also bleach the reds out of your packaging if they're on the shelves too long. That's not desirable. The grocer doesn't want to carry products there long enough to fade. But um, anyway, that's photochemical. Staling, if any of you are into baked goods, you're well aware of, of the impact of staling. This is usually the result of water migration from the swollen starch granules. <clears throat> so 
these molecules realign themselves, causing recrystallization. Refrigeration and temperature variation tend to accelerate the process, but are often a better choice because you want to control microbial growth. There's a real trade-off between freezing baked goods and just keeping them. And it's largely a function of usage, what is going to be the best. Rancidity um, was, was developed as a category based on the sensory appraisal. Um, this is a characteristic of the oils in a product, chemistry caught up, and we ended up with two kinds of rancidity, oxidative, which obviously involves reactions with oxygen. And then we have a hydrolytic, which relates to the release of some objectionable fatty acids in products where we don't want them or where we get too much of them. Oxidative rancidity, um, typically unsaturated fats. Here are some products that are involved. Um, when you have canned tuna, it's not always the tuna that's the problem, but if it was packed in oil that was on its way to rancidity, you have the free radical promoters there and the whole product will be awful in much less than the expected shelf life. It's one of the reasons it's important to use all the oil in a package. Don't keep topping it off. You want to finish from time to time because you don't want to carry over the free radicals, which can, can accelerate the reaction. These reactions are autocatalytic. So once started, they go faster and faster. Hydrolytic rancidity, um, you're releasing free fatty acids from triglycerides. And so you're especially concerned about things with some of the short fatty acids, which have very strong flavors. Um, butyric, caproic, and caprylic, and capric acids are generally the ones that we worry about. And coconut oil and butter are classic cases where this can happen. Um, just pointing out, this kind of rancidity can be promoted by microbial action. Now, what is the difference between a shelf life study and just putting product on a shelf until it spoils. Got a definition here, an examination of performance over time against metrics of purpose under controlled conditions. So a shelf life study is an experiment. You're trying to control all the variables to focus on what matters. You need to focus on suitability for purpose and known failure mechanisms. This requires a customized approach. One size does not fit all. You may find even if you have a line of products that the same metrics don't apply to all of them, even though they're very similar. <clears throat> Why are shelf life studies important? Um, we have to remember that all customers are doing many shelf life studies on the products they have in their pantry. If they find something is unacceptable 
when they go to their pantry, they're going to be dissatisfied and they're going to move away from your products. Um, it's a way to ensure the accuracy of the expiration dates. In the development stages, um, it can guide product development and formulation. Um, having worked for a company with a valuable brand, um, there was never a desire to release a product before its time. Um, the brand was too valuable. Um, if one is considering a formulation change, be it cost reduction or um, improvement, want to make sure that it still delivers the same performance to the consumer. And then from time to time, it's useful just as a check to make sure that a product continues to meet expectations. There are a number of times that a shelf life study should be conducted. Um, we just mentioned during product formulation and prior to a new product launch. But when you're making changes, formulation, ingredients or supplier changes, new packaging or packaging conditions, storage conditions, um, did a very large storage study once upon a day, um, looking at whether or not we could ship juice concentrate dry cargo internationally and then put it back in the freezer. Um, everyone knew that there was going to be some quality loss, but was it going to be enough to justify the cost savings, plugging in um, insulated shipping containers to activate the refrigeration on a ship is expensive. They're generating a lot of electricity. Um, when you're investigating consumer complaints or early, early products failures, it may be appropriate to do the storage study. Ultimately, we have to remember that our customers are doing many individual studies all the time. <clears throat> Let's look at the opportunities for shelf life during the development of a product. We've divided this effort into three stages. There's this research stage, product formulation, and pilot plant trials. You're going to be looking at ingredients. You're going to be wanting to get a handle on the failure mechanisms. You're going to be determining what are the important metrics and the limits of access, acceptance. Um, probably think of this as preliminary shelf life testing. Until you know otherwise, you can usually get away with a smaller number of samples. Um, but you might be measuring more attributes of them as you identify what's important. When you go into commercial scale production, you're going to want to do a more serious study. This is where you want to line up with your food safety of GMP and HACCP plans. Can you make this product safely? And so you'll be assessing the commercial attributes as part of your process validation. If you are processing a product so it's absolutely safe, it may be an absolute failure for the customers. Um, 
juices, retarded and pressure retorts are universally pretty round and disgusting. So people have identified pasteurization on the acidity of these products to use lower temperatures and shorter time. Product launch. This is an ongoing effort. We've got spoilies investigations. If perhaps there's an executional failure. So these are a quick look through the development stages of a product. Now we're going to just recap just a little bit, looking at some of the big classes of products and the kinds of reactions that can occur. In frozen foods, you do get some enzymatic reactions. The low temperatures tends to slow them, but you get changes in color, flavor, and texture. We have learned through experience that it's necessary to blanch some fruits and vegetables to avoid these kinds of problems. There's oxidative reactions. These are free radical mechanisms. So they will occur even at low temperatures. It's just the initiation that can be slowed down by temperature. And again, we're looking at flavor and nutrient changes. Um, toxin production is undesirable, but it can happen. If you get water migration, um, you can get what's commonly referred to as freezer burn. You get desiccation around the edges of a product. So frozen foods are not immune. They have shelf lives for various reasons. <clears throat> Refrigerated foods. It's an area where I have all too much experience. Things happen you would never anticipate. Yes, we can get microbial growth in refrigerated foods. Ready to eat foods such as salads and produce, meat, cheese, sauces, etc. Um, when you get mold growth on the surface of these products, they get kind of fuzzy, they get off flavors. It's important to remember that the visible mold is only basically the fruiting part of it. It usually has a structure weaving down into the food. Didn't all happen overnight. It just appears to have. Again, enzymatic reactions, moisture and senescence. It's a problem. And one last category, ambient foods. These are your shelf stable foods. We're looking at the same class, classes of reactions. Um, Non-enzymatic browning is especially common in some of these products especially if they start out with a light color. And with that, I think it's time for me to turn this over to Heidi. Great, thank you, Eric, for all that great information. Um, so now we will kind of use that information as a basis um, to move into talking about how we set about designing these shelf life studies. So we first will go into, I'll just kind of do an overview here and then we'll go into more detail having some of the slides ahead. But first we discuss the product in detail. So we look at, um, you know, the different changes that could occur for that product, essentially looking at the purpose um, and the goals of this study. We determine 
shelf life indicators. So what are we gonna include in this study? Are we going to do microbial tests? Are we gonna do chemistry, sensory? A lot of times it's a combination of, of all of these different measures that we include. And then at the same time, we, we put together this plan and then that also includes um, the storage conditions. So for here, we you know, are looking at the different storage conditions. Is this gonna be ambient? Is this going to be um, real time? Is it going to be frozen? And from there, we um, can kind of put together this whole Encompass study design. And lastly, um, at the conclusion of the study, we analyze all results and then we provide a estimated shelf life or the predicted shelf life based on the study that we did. So some of the common indicators, um, you know, that when we're discussing the product um, for a shelf life study, we look at some of the common indicators. So we highlight the, the most common or the best ones for a given product um, and how these would be related to, would it be quality changes, food safety, um, as well as sensory. And then essentially what might constitute the end of shelf life for each of these. So listed here are some of the common ones. Um, so we have um, the microbial tests, you have your aerobic plate count, yeast and mold. For some of the refrigerated foods, we would look at psychotropic plate counts because those are a good indicator of organisms that can grow at those you know, lower, more refrigerated temperatures. We have spore formers, pathogens, and then if your product is a probiotic, are we gonna monitor those species as we go through the study? Chemical testing that Eric talked a lot about, some of the rancidity measures, so peroxide, free fatty acids. Are we gonna monitor vitamin loss or degradation over the study? Protein, and then physiochemical, so moisture, pH, water activity, very common to include um, in the study depending on the product. And then sensory, so a lot of times all of these tests can be kind of correlated to sensory. So is that, are we seeing any product failure there, any unacceptable characteristics coming into the product? Now we get to establishing the plan. So we are looking at determining the testing and monitoring frequency based on it an expected change rate. So what is the change rate? Are we going to expect more changes early on in the study or are they gonna be later? Or where do we really wanna catch them? So do we have more test points, you know, kind of bunched in the middle or, or at the beginning of the study or do we really space them out more towards the end to kind of really hone in on where that shelf life will end? Those are kind of all things we discuss um, in kind of determining the test points for the study. Um, and then we look at what are we gonna use for acceptability limits? So are there product specs? Do we have those to kind of use as a basis? Um, and this is definitely important to discuss initially um, so that we have this in mind when we're you know, testing but also analyzing the data. And then looking at collecting the data. So we need to have sufficient test points so that we can show trends. So if we only have you know, a couple of test points over the course of this study, it's not gonna show us the trends and how things are changing. Um, and we also don't wanna have large gaps in the test points, especially when we're not sure where some of those changes are gonna occur, because then we could easily miss that end of shelf life and how are we gonna determine that shelf life if we um, have a really large gap. Um, we need to test beyond the expected shelf life. So you want to have that buffer ensuring product is acceptable beyond that list, listed shelf life, shelf life. A lot of times 130% is used. So we use that for refrigerated studies depending on the temperature of refrigeration that we're holding at um, and testing beyond um, that expected shelf life. And then after each test point, we evaluate results. So we look back to the specs or the acceptability limits that we set early on, and we kind of determine, do we need to make any changes um, in the study based on what we're seeing? Another important aspect of study design is determining storage conditions. So how is the product typically held um, and how will that translate into us setting up a shelf life study? 
So all of these kind of are options of how the product would typically be held and then how we would hold it for a shelf life study. So sometimes it can even be a combination. If you have a product that can be accelerated, you know, to generate that data um, early and faster, we can do an accelerated study, but at the same time, run an ambient real-time study so that we're generating that data in parallel, but we have that ambient real-time study to confirm the shelf life that we get under accelerated conditions. And I know that um, accelerated storage conditions are probably one of the most asked about um, items. Um, and there's definitely some limitations on this. So this is something we will discuss as we're going through the study design and kind of determining the purpose of the study to determine if, you know, a accelerated study is feasible. So how can Amtec help with estimating shelf life? We have um, customizable study designs. And so we have options for accelerated real-time testing um, that can be performed um, at certain times. So we will look at, um, you can do frozen, you can do refrigerated, ambient, or there's also different acceleration rates based on increases in temperature and humidity um, and customizable storage conditions. We can set these different temperatures uh, humidity. We can also um, have different light conditions if that's something that would need to be evaluated for different packaging or different color changes in the product. A sensory evaluation. So we here look at um, color, odor, texture changes over time and compare back to an applicable control that we've been holding. Um, this can also be accompanied by product photos as well. Um, and then there's also chemistry analysis such as um, pH and moisture and then microbial testing that um, we kind of talked about early on that can kind of all be encompassed um, in a study. So essentially each study is specifically designed for the product and the goals of the study and kind of the purpose of the overall shelf life. And for shelf life studies at Amtec, we offer a couple things that can really make a difference. So first we're able to start your study immediately. Um, there's no waiting time between study design and your study start date. We can begin testing as quickly as you can get samples to the lab and we have a approved proposal. Um, and this is especially important for projects um, that are on a tight timeline. We also give you updates um, after each test point which allows you to track results. Um, and then we also highlight changes that you, know, you should pay attention to or that we want to discuss so that we can alter test points, we can change analyses or add different tests in. Um, we can also change the duration. And all of these you know, are things that we learn as we go through the study. So we have that flexibility um, to do that. Um, we also, when talking about shelf life studies, each study must be as unique as the product itself. So in order to achieve these accurate results that we're looking for, um, we have people like myself um, that are designing these studies um, you know, for each product. So they're custom designed based on product specifications and essentially the individual needs. And lastly, um, as with all Amtec services, you have easy access to um, any of us that you want to ask questions to for project planning, you can get your questions answered. And we have open discussion and communication every step of the way so that we can make adjustments as needed. And you can understand how your study is progressing and what the results mean as we go. So the process of a shelf life study design um, and in initiation at Amtec, um, we collect the product information in the form of a questionnaire. And so we use this information from the inquiry form or a phone conversation to prepare a study design. So this is then provided um, for review. So after review, we can make modifications or changes, we get approval. I and mean, at that point, we are ready to receive samples and we can begin testing according to the plan. Uh, updates are sent after each test point. And then at the end of the study, a final report is done um, with a C of A that encompasses essentially all the results. 
So everything is in one place. You can easily compare results um, and you have that final sort of report of the estimated shelf life. And with that, I want to thank you all for attending today. And I will now turn this over to our moderator, Jessica, who will take some of the questions that were submitted. Thank you so much, Heidi and Eric. So we do have a few questions that came through. Um, I know we have a lot, so I'm gonna try and get through as many as possible. Um, one of the questions that came through was, why do we aim to test for 130% of the shelf life? And is this the minimum that is typically expected from the industry? I'm not sure it's the minimum or, or that, it's just kind of a good standard. Um, and I've seen some different requirements from different um, organizations or places that require shelf life studies that 130% is a good measure so that you're testing, you know, a good deal beyond that expected shelf life. Um, yeah, and, the, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about, again, if uh, the shelf life is longer, ends up being longer than you expected it, at least you then also have some extra product as well, right? Correct, yeah. So we always look to have, you know, additional product um, held um, at our facility or in the typical storage condition so that we are able to continue to, you know, do this testing, um, you know, as the product remains acceptable. Great. Um, another question that came through is, can you have an accelerated testing and a real-time testing, uh, or it can only be either or? Um, so you can definitely have either or of them, just depending on the typical storage conditions and actually what that real time test will consist of. So that will that be an ambient test or will it be, you know, frozen, which then, you know, there's not really acceleration for it. Um, but it is always re recommended at some point to do an accelerated or to do a real time study um, of a product so that you have that you know, really good estimate of a shelf life. Um, acceleration gives you, you know, it, it just gives you an estimated shelf life. So the real-time testing gives you a more accurate one. Great. Uh, the next question is, our FSQA group routinely holds product. Why do I need routine storage studies? So many times it is good to have a third party shelf life study. So as we kind of went through this whole study design, you know, looking at the purpose of the study, um, you know, to have all of the results encompassed in a certificate of analysis um, that can be presented to, you know, anybody that is asking for it. So um, sometimes it's even recommended or it's required to have a third party shelf life study. Um, and so we have also the controlled conditions where everything is documented and monitored um, and have the lab accreditations for all of these tests that are included. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, how can we test the shelf life of ingredients that are sold in bulk packaging? So a lot of times for those type of studies, um, it can be done in different ways. We can, um, take the bulk packaging and aliquot out um, at different test points or aliquot out at the beginning of the study and hold it um, because essentially that bulk packaging, you're going to be sampling from it, um, you know, over time as in just a normal condition of, you know, using that product. So that's how we would typically start those is we would take the product, we would aseptically aliquot it into containers for each test point and then, you know, to sample um, at each test point using that aliquoted product. Okay, and uh, when you do an accelerated study, how do you estimate the equivalent real time? So there's some different formulas out there in terms of increasing the temperature. So say from an ambient product, if you're increasing the temperature 10 degrees Celsius, that would be a two times acceleration. So we kind of use that um, 10 degrees increase um, as every two times acceleration for an ambient health product. 
Perfect. Um, well, um, one person asked, when, when we find white spots on shrimp, uh, like if it was sprinkled with sea salt, is that a colony growth? We find, um, that would be something that you would have to kind of look at. Um, you know, we would have to evaluate the product and kind of see because it could just be a normal change in the product. Um, you know, otherwise you can see like yeast colonies, you could see mold colony growth on products, um, but it also could just be a function of product changes. So it'd be, it would be something we would have to have to look at to evaluate. Okay, and uh, the next question, how do you determine the number of samples for a storage study? So when we're designing the shelf life study, we kind of know how many test points we're going to include. Um, and then from there, we know that we need to take new unopened samples at each test point. Um, also, if we're including sensory evaluation, we want a new unopened product for that at each test point. Um, and we factor in all of that and then add a number of additional products so that we can continue testing if we need to. We can do retests, we can add additional tests, um, and then we have controls. So depending on the, the study that we've designed, we also have control samples that are held. Um, and it's always better to have more samples um, held at those conditions so that we have the option for additional testing, um, especially if these are accelerated conditions. Great. Um, then the next question is, how do you know when to end the study? So a lot of this is based on um, the acceptability limits that we talked about um, first, as well as the purpose of the study. So are we looking at um, micro related changes? Is it going to be more quality changes from a sensory standpoint? So um, this is where after each test point, we kind of talk about any changes that we've seen and determine if we feel the quality is changing, the shelf life is reaching its end, or if it has surpassed some of um, you know, the specifications that were set initially. Great, and then, uh, the next question that came through is how often do you test during a study? Weekly, monthly? So that will depend on the length of the study. So if it's going to be a, you know, your study will definitely test monthly. If it's going to be a couple month study, we can do it weekly or, you know, on different day test points. So it really is we take that, the expected shelf life and we, you know, space the test points out accordingly um, so that we cover a good range of it and we don't have any large gaps in test points. Um, the next question, is there an actual amount of samples is there an actual amount of the sample required when conducting a shelf life study? Um, there are required amounts for, depending on the testing, for microbial testing, you know, it's in the, the range of 50 grams or so, but if we're looking at like rancidity testing, that will be a couple hundred grams per test point. Uh, but as I said, it's best to have unopened containers. So we kind of discuss, you know, what the, each container or sample size is, um, and then we kind of determine the number needed for the shelf life based on the test that we have included. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. If your question didn't get answered, we will follow up with you afterwards. Um, the, the next one is a follow up to the bulk packaging. Um, if you were to put the samples in individual containers, will the difference in packaging for example, bulk versus individual container lead to inaccurate results? Um, I mean, this is a, a question that we can kind of discuss, you know, in more detail too, based on the actual product or, you know, in question. Um, but I mean, we can hold bulk product too um, and sample from it at each test point, but a lot of times transferring it to individual containers 
um, still gives a good representation of the product shelf life. Um, it just, you know, is less likely for, you know, contamination at each test point. Um, but there are a lot of ways that, um, you know, a bulk versus a bulk packaging sort of shelf life study can be done. It really depends on the mechanism of failure, which you're concerned about. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Eric and Heidi, both. Um, with that, we are out of time for today. I wanna to thank everyone again for joining us. If we didn't get to your question again, please feel free to shoot us an email at lab at amtech.com and we'll be sure to get back to you with an answer. Um, we'll also be going through the list of questions and if we didn't answer, uh, we'll have Heidi or Eric follow up with you and send you a separate email. Um, we also encourage anyone who's interested in shelf life testing with us to submit an inquiry form on our website so you can schedule a meeting to discuss your needs. Thank you so much again for attending today's webinar and we look forward to seeing you at the next one in August on the topic of environmental monitoring. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.